Welcome to our 251st weekly webcast. Now, we have a very special guest this week who is Brent Thill, and he's one of the top analysts in the world. And I'm going to interview Brent, and then after the interview, Brent will take your questions. So please keep typing your questions. And Brent Thill is the technology sector leader and also a software and internet analyst at Jefferies. And the institutional investor results were just released. And his Jefferies tech team of analysts received more votes than any other tech team of analysts, more than Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, etc. And before joining Jefferies, Brent was the tech sector leader at UBS. And prior to that, he held senior analyst positions at Citigroup, Prudential, and Credit Suisse. He's also an advising founder of CalFund at the University of California, Berkeley for technology startups. Now, if it weren't for Brent, I would not live in the Bay Area, as he was the key reference for me when I joined Citadel out here in the Bay Area many years ago. Now, stocks that Brent covers include Workday, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, Salesforce, Adobe, Intuit, and many others. He's a really good guy, and he's also an incredible stock picker. He's on CNBC all the time. And so it is my great honor and great privilege to interview Brent Thill. Brent, thank you so much. I'm so humbled that you're with us today. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you. So my first question is, what are your three favorite buy ideas based on the companies that you cover? Right now, uh, Microsoft is one of our favorites, given uh, the AI uh, wave that's about to hit into 2024 and 25. We think Microsoft's going through one of those fundamental shifts of uh, true product cycle upgrade. And these co-pilots in AI are, are generating... Uh, much higher pricing, and they're actually charging so much money that they're covering their costs, so it's not margin dilutive on the bottom line. So it's one of those unique situations where they're making money on the top and, and the bottom, even while the compute costs or AI are expensive. Uh, incredible management team. Uh, I think it's one of the most trustworthy teams. We, we think the stock's going to 400 uh, for Microsoft. I'd say uh, the second would be Workday. Uh, I really believe in management teams and and believe in Carl, Carl Eschenbach. Carl uh, ran the go-to-market at VMware, went to Sequoia as a top venture capitalist. And he's come in and he's running the company at a completely different speed. If they were running, uh, you know, seven miles an hour now, they're running much faster. Uh, and, and they've got a different track suit on and different running shoes. And I think uh, with the addition of the new CFO, Zane, from from VMware and and uh, what's happened with with Carl? I think they're going to re-energize uh, the opportunity at Workday. And again, they have two main competitors, SAP and Oracle, and are doing really well. So we like we like that as a, a steady eddy. Um, my my last one would be Adobe. I think they have the best AI of any of the companies we cover. Uh, we still really like the position Adobe's in with uh, the AI opportunity. They launched a product called Firefly. So we'll let your 11 year old go on. And create a birthday card and they can do simple text and, and create cards uh, without even having to be an illustrator and, and bring any photos in it just the ai generates and says i i want three of my friends in front of a, a ferris wheel with bright lights and um it'll generate in, in a nanosecond and so i think the opportunity that adobe's had and this has been a story that you know i've, I've liked for a long time so those would be three that, that i like there's there's an internet i'd say uh amazon and Meta are, are my, my top two in, in internet. Awesome, thank you. And in terms of your $400 target price on Microsoft, how'd you come up with that? So we continue to believe uh, that Microsoft's a story that can generate $15 of earning power. Hmm. And you can effectively put uh, you know, a, a high 20, low 30 multiple on the stock and you're getting, you know, you're getting there, you're getting north of 400. And so we, we value it on an earnings basis. Um, obviously, Microsoft's still growing double digit at their size, which is incredible. It's another billion dollar run rate growing 10 plus percent. But when you when you get to the profitability of Microsoft has, we, we look at earnings. Mm -hmm. Some of the hyper growth stories, we'll look at a multiple revenue because they don't have earnings or, or cash flow. Um, so we we simply just look at you know earnings power of $15 plus and uh, you can you can pick a multiple a range of multiples and you're, you're going to get up. You're going to get a higher price target. I think the other um, component that drives it higher is just when you look at, they were the first out of the gate in AI. And if you look at what happened in past cycles, whether it was Apple with the iPhone or 
what happened in the internet era, what happened with Tesla and electric cars. I mean, they, they really are kind of first to market and they are first to market with incremental pricing. And, uh, as we, as you know, uh, in these technology shifts, uh, we call them these big tectonic shifts. There tends to be one vendor that takes all. So NVIDIA has taken, you know, an AI. Uh, you look at what happened, you know, in the I, uh, with, with the iPhone, we know what happened there. Uh, so we think Microsoft, in, at least in software right now, is taking the position of NVIDIA where they're predominantly taking the most market share of any, any of the companies because of their product leadership. That's great. Thank you. And aside from Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Adobe, what other companies do you think are best positioned to benefit from AI? So we have a simple thesis in AI. The companies that have the most data and the most users win. Mm-hmm. And it's a really boring answer, but it's, it's uh, effectively in enterprise, it's Amazon and Microsoft. And then in consumer, it'll be Google. Google knows, knows us. It knows our, our behavior. I turn on YouTube TV in the morning and it knows what I like to watch. I watch a business channel at night. I watch a sports channel. My kids log on. They, they, they get something completely different. And so I think the, the kind of the common theme we're looking for is very few companies can create AI because it's so expensive. Mm-hmm. And so you have to have the big balance sheet, uh, and, and the capex that is required. So mm-hmm. we go back to, uh, the simple stories, like the, the big stories are going to win. And, and that's, you know, what's been happening kind of year to date. You look at Amazon up 63% year to date. Google's up 45. Microsoft's uh, up 45. I mean, all these names have outperformed. Mm-hmm. You know many of the, the the broader indexes because um, because of those characteristics. Now there will be other AI winners, like we mentioned. Adobe um, has has incredible AI, um, and we know who the losers are right now too, or or those that are lagging. We we've identified you know companies like Salesforce. They don't have the AI ready yet for prime time. They could over time, but there's there's companies that are just ahead. Um, and then you know as it relates to uh, our tech team, uh, Nvidia. And AMD are, are two names. AMD is actually one I think is really coming up. Many of the hyperscalers we talked to are using NVIDIA, but they're starting to turn to AMD because they can't get enough supply hmm. for NVIDIA. So AMD is another story that uh, our, our semi team uh, really likes around the age of AI. Their, their MX chips are getting really good reviews. So I think that's going to be, um, be a great story as well over time. Now, how do you use AI to do investment research on companies? We don't yet. Uh, it's a good question. And I think one of the things we've talked about is we're in a hype cycle right now. We're in the hype cycle of AI. And today, uh, our research department is evaluating how we use AI because today, um, the head of research's fear is that we're going to use, uh, AI and it's, it, it, we've, it's been widely talked about this hallucination problem, which is the AI engine will come back and say, if you ask a question, it says it brings back an answer and it may not be correct. And so we're worried that, you know, junior analysts, even senior analysts could rely on it. And, and then a client asks a question and, and we, we turn to that. So I think today we're, we're carefully evaluating how we use AI. I think we're going to first use it in productivity, mm-hmm. you know, how to, how to write emails, how to, how to respond. I wake up in the morning and, and, and I have, uh, and you remember these days, Chris, and you probably still have this. You have 400 emails in your inbox. Which one's from a client? Which one's from your in, internal peers? Which one's from, you know, the news flow that you don't, doesn't really make maybe matter and you can delete that out. So I think we're going to use AI first in basically productivity of how do I clean my inbox? How do I, how do I actually uh, start to formulate uh, response on emails? How do we create a template for research that is standard? And I think right now we're, we're, really, really early days. And I think this is the same use case across all AI that everyone is saying we are like, like first pitch uh, of the first inning. I mean, we are so early and all the vendors create this hype that it's taken off. I mean, remember less than 50% of Microsoft's products are shipping in AI. Mm -hmm. Oracle said no revenue in AI in fiscal 24. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've, we've heard, we've heard many cases of and like, this is just really, really early. So the products aren't really ready for prime time, but I think every board globally is, is jumped on this bigger than Bitcoin, bigger than web three, bigger than some of these other trends. Cause they see, you know, the opportunity to help 
augment, not replace it, uh, in, employees. And right now we don't see this replacing anyone yet, mm-hmm. but it, it will help augment and make us more productive as, uh, as employees. That makes a lot of sense what you're saying, especially when it comes to hallucinations. Now, I've used the advanced data analysis feature in ChatGPT to create spreadsheets and financial models and then download them in Excel. And it's incredibly fast and quite often it's confidently wrong and there's lots of errors in the data. But it's it's definitely something that's going to help us with financial models longer term, I think. Yeah, cool. Uh, next question is, when you launch coverage on a new company, what are your research steps in terms of qualitative, quantitative research and then coming up with target prices? Yes, every um, report is different and it's a, it's a matrix of things. It's not one thing. Uh, but I think what we go back to is, you know, the first step is we try to build a model. We, we try to take the publicly available data and build that model, build assumptions in the model. Uh, we then uh, try to meet with management. We try to hear the management team story uh, we go meet competitors. We we try to talk to competitors. We'll we'll try to talk to maybe their investors mm-hmm. that are early stage that that know. And many times I would come to you and ask you questions about stocks that I covered because you knew more than I did. Mm-hmm. So you you know you, you lean on your friends in the industry that are investors uh, on this. We uh, we'll go and look at uh, different data analytics tools. We use a, a product um, called Similar Web, which we can understand you know website traffic to Adobe.com or to different websites and understand, you know, are, are people actually visiting uh, the website? Uh, we'll we'll go uh, and talk to partners, and uh, we we use uh, experts, system integrators that that resell these products. And so we tend to go through a very long checklist. It's it's analogous to a pilot going through a, you know, pulling out the card, and and it the process of getting a plane started can take longer than the taxi to the runway. And so we ensure kind of this pre pre-flight checklist, as we call it, uh, is very long. It's intricate. And and part of this, too, is gut, right? Part of this is you and I have seen this before where you, you know if a management team is telling you something that doesn't make sense. Um, sometimes they're too bullish. And you're like, why are you so bullish? Like, this doesn't seem that exciting. And then you go triple check it and maybe you're wrong. Um, and we're wrong all the time. Uh, and I think that's the that's the good lesson, which is where we're, you have to have an open mind. You have to go through the checklist. And we'll go through that process. And usually it'll take two or three of us. It's not just myself. Hmm. Yeah. Makes so sense. We t- we'll typically touch, you know, 15 to 20 plus different individuals in a process to ensure that we cover our bases and make sure we're not missing something. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Now, a lot of our viewers uh, want to work in the financial services sector in a position like yours. So what advice would you give them to increase their chances of getting hired? Be curious um, and don't give up. Uh, I'll give you a story. I worked in the IT department uh, in, at, a, at a bank called Piper Jaffray, and I went to the head of research, uh, Gary Blower uh, at Piper. I said, I've been working here four years. I, I've been working in IT. I really want to work in the research department. He goes, kid, you don't have your MBA. And I said, well, that doesn't matter because I've actually built the systems you're running the company, uh, the IT systems. And he, he's like, go get your MBA. I walked across the street and worked for a competitive firm. Mm-hmm. And we were crushing that firm in tech. And I was working with more dynamic, exciting people that understood that it, it took curiosity and drive. And that went farther than than any degree would take you. And so I'd say that, you know, I didn't get my MBA. I didn't go to a profile Ivy League. Uh, and we effectively... Um, as you said earlier, you know, we've, we were, we were proud that our team was able to take down the highest vote count in, in an institutional investor magazine. And that's just grit, curiosity and hard work and not giving up. And that really is honestly the most important thing that matters here is that you, every, I tell this to my team, stay curious. If you're not curious, uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna survive in, in the investment business. And, uh, you know, think outside the box. You know, we, a lot of times you have to challenge kind of what the companies are saying, what investors think, and you cut across the grain for what you think is right. But uh, the number one lesson I've had is, uh, you know, 99% of this is just showing up, have, being curious and, and having drive. And, and that goes a long, long way. That's a great answer. Thank you. Now, what is a day in the life like for an equity analyst? 
every day is different. You know, you, you wake up and, and every day is different. You might have an earnings call. You might have a, a call with, with Europe. Uh, you might wake up and a, a stock you cover is down 20% and you're trying to put out a fire and you spend half the day putting the fire out and you have to wipe your calendar clean because of that. Um, and you know, we have some of that today. We have some flare ups today that, that went up, went up more than we thought. We had some flare ups where, you know, a company called Procore and construction then did, did have a great quarter and we liked it and it's down 18%. So now we're explaining, you know, why we downgraded it. And so every day, and I think that's what's so great about this business is, you know, when I'm looking at my, my screen next to me and I'm looking at a hundred different stocks, you know, you, you, there's something that's exciting and different every day. And that's why investment business is, is so fun. Um, you know, a lot of it's travel. So, uh, on the sell side, uh, there's quite a bit of travel visiting clients, uh, on the buy side, uh, probably a little less travel. So if you, you're more of an introvert, you like to look at stocks and, and pick stocks up or down, you know, the buy side is probably more exciting. If you're an extro- extrovert, you want to be on the road, you want to travel. Like, I mean, it's been a great career for me and that's all I've known, but that, um, you know, the travel piece, I think is a, is a big, is a big one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it can get taxing at times. Uh, but, you know, visiting clients, helping clients, helping them understand the pros and cons of these stories with, we have a global audience. So I fly to Asia, to Europe, um, you know, we've, we've got, we've got a, a, a big global audience and that requires a, a tremendous amount of travel. So that, that can be taxing. Mm-hmm. Um, but every day, again, it's just, it's so different. It just, and I think that the good news being in the West coast is your day ends a little earlier. <laughs> so you get a little time. So if you have young kids, which I do. Um, it's good to spend the afternoons with them. You start early and, and, and earlier, but the job never really ends. You get maybe an hour to throw the ball to your daughter outside and, uh, and then you're back at it until, till late. But every day is, is so different. And that's what I love. As my wife said, if you were for a software company, you'd be bored because you'd be doing the same thing every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. diversity, diversity has been great in this business. That's great. Excellent. Now, Let's say a company reports earnings at 4 p.m. New York time. What is the process that you use to quickly analyze the performance of the company faster than the competition does? We tend to think about how we add value and how we do the pre-call versus reporting the news. So one of the things that I think we leaned into is I don't flip out when numbers get launched because a lot of other competitors do. But as, as we say, I want to predict the news, not report the news. Yeah. And so I'm hopefully in a, in a position where we at least flag what's about to hit. And then our team will go through the numbers. We've already pre wrote a note, which basically will inject the numbers in mm-hmm. and we'll understand our, our, and then a spreadsheet of all the key metrics and we'll plug in all the key metrics and instantly it tells you, you know, where are the issues? We'll talk to our trader. Hey, what, what are you hearing? What's going on? What, what's the feedback for the buy side? And they'll typically, the trading desk will hear that because they'll start to see in stock trading. And then we'll, 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 sometimes we'll publish a note right after, but we'll effectively understand those key performance indicators of, um, you know, deferred revenue, re- revenue, earnings, all the key metrics. And, uh, I think over time it's pattern recognition, right? Yeah. And every stock has a different, driver too. And so there'll be different components that matter more or, or less. And so, for example, you know, the first thing we went to last night on Procore when they reported, what's their backlog number? They missed the number. That's the leading indicator of health. Nothing else mattered. Yeah. Nothing else mattered. Yeah. That, that indicates what's going to happen. So, uh, we go through, we go through that process like we do on initiation, hmm. but I'd say when we get to that point, where it's pretty simple, which is we have a, we have everything kind of plugged in and then the numbers come and there's three or four numbers that are really going to matter. Yeah. And then the callback with the management team trying to understand, you know, do they get it? Do they, did like maybe something went wrong, but are they showing enough urgency? Again, I'll pick on Procore. I didn't feel like they had enough urgency around showing better margins. They seem more cavalier about it. I didn't like that answer. Investors didn't like that answer. And that, that, you know, kind of gave us some sign that, Hey, maybe the stock's going lower until they get conviction that they've got their expenses under control. That makes sense. Thanks. And for my students, uh, backlog means revenue plus the change in deferred revenue. Cool. All right. Next up. Um, 
how do you decide which software and internet companies to cover? You're my client, Chris, and you <laughs> dictate it. Um, so based on uh, what our clients care about is where we go. Right. And so that's the honest answer. I think the the other answer for a lot of the big investment banks, um, you know, the research and banking teams are separated, but some of the firms, uh, and not necessarily my firm, but other firms will have research mandates where mm -hmm. if they did a transaction for a management team, raise capital, whatever, they may have a research mandate where they are instructed they have to cover it. Right. Uh, so there's that element of some some of the banks have that uh, mandate in that you you have to you have to provide coverage. Again, the, the coverage is not because you did a transaction. You have to put a certain rating on. You are completely independent, putting your own rating. You know, right. view as a separate separate wall is up between that. But that mandate uh, could be in. But mm -hmm. I'd say the, the the names that are liquid that are our larger cap for us um, tend to be the names that our clients care more about mm -hmm. than, the, than the, the names that are thinly traded. Um, sometimes we don't get a lot of questions on. Um, but and in some of those situations, and we cover some of the small cap names where you can make a difference and you can mm -hmm. you can have a different uh, a, a view and opinion that may, may be different and be helpful. So we cover mm -hmm. large, mid, small uh, across across those caps. And it's largely focus on, again, what our clients care about or are the ones that matter. That makes sense. Thank or where you can make yeah. money as well. Yeah. If you think you can make money in an idea, we'll cover it. Right. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Now, aside from AI, what other investable trends do you see or do your hedge fund clients, for example, talk about? Well, cloud is obviously the, the last uh, the last theme before we jump to AI, but cloud is still alive and kicking. You know, many of these uh, large financial services, governments, uh, they, they haven't moved to public cloud. Their data is still trapped in private cloud. So I'd say, you know, the cloud the cloud names are are big uh, big big drivers. The hyperscaler, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, um, that's a big topic topic area. You mentioned AI, um, cybersecurity. We have a dedicated team on cyber. Cyber's been a, one of the best underperforming uh, subsectors of the year. Um, the breaches are going to continue to get worse, and the cyber landscape, you know, changes uh, every day. So cyber is another big area of theme. Uh, infrastructure software has been hot because you can't have the public cloud work without infrastructure. Uh, big focus on vertical applications. So companies like Tyler and Government, Procore, mm -hmm. in in construction, you know, how you talk the language of those industries. Uh, education software, we cover a lot of education software names uh, like Chegg and, and others and, and EdTech. Uh, but I think, yeah, there's multiple themes. Um, I'd say 90% of the attention right now is on AI and mm -hmm. can't have a conversation without someone asking you about it. Um, I think everyone is like, I want to put the earmuffs on. Don't want to talk about AI anymore, but like, yeah. you, you can't. It's just yeah. front and center and yeah, I agree. That's a great answer. Thank you. I got a question now uh, from Anarag who wrote, and Brent, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Um, so Anarag wrote, which valuation methodologies do you prefer for valuing stocks? And then how do you value a startup? So if you're mature and you're not growing fast and you have big margins and, and good cash flow, we'll tend to look at a uh, EBITDA or cash flow multiple. Hmm. Um, if you're hyper growth and you have no profitability, you'll look at an EV, uh, EV to sales, uh, enterprise value to sales. Uh, and so we'll tend to look at, we'll tend to look at those multiples in terms of evaluating startup. You know, we'll, we'll go in and, and look, uh, you know, first thing I look at is management team. I've seen so many startups where I'm like, I do not believe in this management member. Or I really believe in this management member and that that individual I've seen and it's recycled and I, I've done this for 25 years now. I you see management team to race, recycle through, mm -hmm. and that gives you confidence. It's like if Chris went to start his own hedge fund, I'd invest in a nanosecond because I know his process, I know him, I know him as a person, you know, and and that gives you that confidence. So for me, it's always the management team. Do I believe in the person that's running this? What's the team like? How long have they been there? What's their experience? That I think matters a lot in a startup. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, that that's not the only factor. Is we 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 found out about with Mark Zuckerberg, 
uh, who had never obviously been been a big big founder before. Um, so that's a big factor for me. And then we tend to look at we go through the same process as launching a company. What's the competitive landscape? Who are they trying to attack? Is the market new? Is it existing? Uh, what's their growth? Uh, you know, what's their route to market? How efficient can they be? What's their cost of acquisition for customers? It's a really long list. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a pretty similar list than as you would use for launching coverage on a software company. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Great question from Renvir uh, from Mauritius. He wrote, when meeting with technology CEOs, how do you differentiate between good and bad CEOs? So let me give you an example. When Nadella and Microsoft was announced, I had met him at a Microsoft analyst day and no one knew who he was. Hmm. And I was just struck by how empathetic he was, how, how thoughtful he was. He, he, he didn't attack any of the questions I asked. He, he tried to answer. He understood my perspective and he, he took this very neutral approach. And, you know, I, I said, well, how did you end up running the server business. And he's like, well, we didn't make our way to cloud. We missed virtualization and we couldn't figure out how to price our database. And I fixed all of them. And, and I feel good about what we achieved. So he was bragging, but he was also like downplaying it. And he was very humble. And I think I've seen too many CEOs that are just hotheads that, that are, are too aggressive and uh, are, are too showy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a bad, really bad sign. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to look at um, kind of the character, uh, and really kind of dig in on that, that, that side. And again, when, when Nadella took over for Microsoft, you know, S Steve Ballmer was a different character. You know, Steve was, was a sales guy and they kind of missed all these shifts. Mm -hmm. And when Nadella was like humble and he's like, I did this, this, and this, and I fixed these things. I'm like, this guy, I just feel like he could fix the whole company. Yeah. And that was at $30 and Microsoft went to three, three fifty. So that's one example. Uh, I think, you know, past experience, you know, there's a lot of CEOs that aren't humble, but have past experience. L you know, let me give you an example. Um, I have tremendous amount of respect for the CEO of Snowflake. Mm -hmm. um, he's very aggressive. Frank. Yeah. Uh, he is yeah. very focused. Yeah. Frank Slubin. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what he did at ServiceNow was incredible, but, you know, he will light you up if you ask a question. And I've asked some questions and he's lit me up, but I respect him. And he's yeah. aggressive, but he's yeah. got a proven track record. So there's certain situations where you can be a little more aggressive uh, and, and maybe a little less um, empathetic, if you will, than Nadella was, but but it can execute. And so that's a you know that's another characteristic that I've I've looked at, and I'm okay passing passing through. Okay, he, he may not he may not like the questions I'm asking, but he can execute. Yeah. So that's another characteristic we'll look at. That's great. Cool. Just a couple more quick questions. So Manas from India uh, is asking, is NVIDIA overvalued or undervalued as compared to AMD? Um, and just what are your thoughts in general uh, on the valuation? So I don't cover yeah. uh, NVIDIA. Yeah. Our semi-analyst uh, does, yeah. and our semi-analyst is the number one rated yeah. uh, guy on the street. Huh. He still uh, believes NVIDIA is under undervalued because he thinks that effectively mm -hmm. we're still mm -hmm. in the super cycle and then we've got we're still many hyperscalers can't get enough supply from NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. And so he has a $610 price target stocks for 32. He thinks it's going higher. Wow. He's also a fan of AMD. And I'd say that the work I'm doing in software is showing that the software companies are leaning harder on NVIDIA, but they're trying to branch out and have two suppliers. Mm -hmm. And we're hearing good things from Microsoft or good things from Oracle and others in the industry that AMD is going to be uh, the backup quarterback, if you will, to to NVIDIA. And so we're hearing really good things about uh, AMD. Hmm. And uh, again, our semi ounce has a $130 price target. So um, he likes both names, thinks both are going higher. Again, they're not my companies. Yeah. I'm just voicing yeah. our team's opinion of, of where yeah. they're going. But I think they're both both in a great spot still as it relates to this this AI cycle we're in, which is really at the early sign, early stages so congratulations again on getting II number one or, <clears throat> pardon me, the most technology votes for the team that you you lead. So that, that's awesome. Two more quick questions and we'll wrap it up. Um, first one is, how do you stay up to date with the latest technology trends? 
you read a lot, you talk to a lot of people, you, you talk to, you know, I lean on the buy side, friends on the buy side that, you know, have a lot of interaction with the manager teams. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's a, it's a combination of, uh, it's a combination. And I think the most important thing is talking to customers. Yeah. You know, right. You talk to the customers and say, Hey, does this work? Like AMD is a great example. We're at Oracle. Hey, what do you think about AMD? Yeah, we're deploying them. We're going to deploy them in early 24. We feel really good. The quality is there. We're, we're impressed. So, you know, when, when a big buyer says that, you know, it's a data point. Um, so I tend to rely more heavily on what the customers are seeing. Right. Perfect. That's the most important thing. Makes sense. Thanks. Last question is this. If you could go back in time, what advice would you have given yourself before you started your career on Wall Street? I probably have more patience. Um, I think, you know, when you're starting your career, you want to just race and you want to, you want to, you want to be at the top and you want to, you, 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 I, I was always anxious. And I think the most important thing is, you know, to take the time and not be anxious, you'll get to your journey, just have that, that map and have that true north of where you want to be. And, hmm. and, and don't feel like you got to rush it because it comes. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I say this, I never thought we would end up where we ended up. And I, I think that, you know, just keeping that true north and continuing to, to give yourself time. And also, I think the most important thing is make mistakes. Yeah. And I say this to my team all the time, like, like you can't be perfect the whole way. This is a really hard business. You're going to make mistakes, but then learn from those mistakes and then try not to do them again. Mm. Uh, and I probably didn't take enough of a risk early on in my career. Mm. Take risk, mm. take the calculator risk. Yeah. And as Amazon says, Fail fast. That's <laughs> when yeah. you fail. M move on. Exactly. But. Exactly. Great. Brent, God bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we've all learned so much just listening to you today. And uh, please keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris. All right. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. All right. That was awesome. I learned so much. And in terms of patience, you know, Brent is right. Uh, Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. You got, you got to have a long-term game uh, as well. So that, that was awesome. That was a real treat. Uh, and I'm going to be getting more high-profile people like Brent uh, on these interviews going forward as, as well. All right. Let me get to your questions now. All right. I'll kick it off with, uh, let's see here. Well, these are all questions for, for Brent. Um, question is, hey, Chris, is it time to sell all crypto holdings? Um, so I'm... I'm very long-term focused, as you know, um, but I'd be careful cryptocurrencies in general. I don't recommend having more than 5% of your liquid net worth in cryptocurrencies because most are a scam. And of that 5%, if you're going to do it, I don't recommend more than 0.5% in any one particular crypto. The problem with cryptocurrencies is there's lack of disclosure. When you invest in a publicly traded company, you can go to sec.gov and read the S1 IPO filings, the 10K, which is the annual report, the 10Q, et cetera. With cryptocurrencies, they're kind of sort of regulated by mathematics and not by governments. And so I think that we need a little bit more regulation in terms of disclosure before I can comfortably tell my students to go all in on cryptos. Yeah. But if you own cryptos, I, I really recommend that you don't keep it in a hot storage wallet uh, online. Keep it in a cold storage wallet, like a Ledger Nano or a Trezor, for example, because all online exchanges could one day go bankrupt. We just don't know. Better to be careful. All right. The next question I have got here is, what is the, the main limitation in AI currently? I, I'd say there's a couple of things, and, and I've given presentations to you know, very large companies that you guys have heard of uh, on AI, along with uh, my partner, Luca Anison. And a lot of the companies we present to are really worried about privacy and security, really worried. Even companies like Google are telling their employees, don't use AI at work unless you're experimenting or doing research. Uh, you got to double check the data completely. So what I'm working on right now is a very thorough uh, financial analysis AI course that I'm going to give to you guys all soon. I'll, I'll release it soon. And what I found is that AI makes mistakes all the time. It doesn't matter if it's Google Bard, uh, ChatGPT, uh, or Microsoft's Bing Chat product. You have to double check all the data. And the problem is that whenever you ask these AI uh, engines questions, they give you the answer really quickly and they're confidently wrong. 
it, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if, it, if, if you guys have ever met people that are so confident, they're overconfident, that you think that confidence leads to competence. It doesn't. Double check the data always, yeah. All right, uh, next question I've got here is, let's see here. Uh, uh, from uh, C, C wrote here, I have an MBA and I'm working on AI ethics uh, and IBA, uh, but I'd like to transition into the finance industry and I'm having difficulty transitioning and getting interviews uh, with my IT background. Yeah, it's very similar to, to Brent because Brent started out at Piper Jaffrey uh, working in tech for four years uh, and then he transitioned uh, to the research side. And the way he did it was he was proactive, he was intellectually curious and he networked. And the most important skill set in business is networking. And every time you see a job opening online, the probability of you getting that job is literally one out of 250. So how do you get a job and who gets that job? Well, ultimately, most of the time, the person that gets that job knows somebody at the company. So if these are the new unwritten rules of commerce, then you have to network like crazy. You know, relationships are more important than product knowledge and your network is your net worth. And so I recommend having a, an up-to-date LinkedIn profile, which I teach in my courses and my MBA programs, and then reaching out to 20 people at each company that you want to work at and network with them. And when you're networking with them, you know, at the very beginning, there's small talk, obviously. And if, and if you're not sure uh, what to talk about in terms of what you have in common with the person you're meeting with, go to their Twitter or X profile to see who they follow. If they follow athletes, you can talk about sports that you love, like baseball, for example. And what you have to do in these meetings is you have to bond before business always. Then they're going to very politely ask you this question. And they're not going to ask it this way, but they're going to say something along the lines of, why are we meeting? And at that point, you mentioned, you know, I'm really interested in a career uh, commensurate with the career you have and at your company. And I'd love to humbly ask you for, for tips, please, on how I can transition to get a job at your company. I know it's direct, but closed mouths don't get fed. You know, ask and you'll receive. It's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. You have to ask over and over and over again. So why would somebody take a meeting with you if you just send out a LinkedIn email? Well, the reason people will take meetings with you is if you have something in common with them. And so I always recommend reaching out to people using LinkedIn emails only and not email. Why is that? Because nobody reads emails but everybody on this call has read every in-mail you've ever received probably. So in the in-mail, what you do is you type this. John, for example, hope all is well. And then list two things you have in common with them. I'm also from Mississauga, which is true. And I also went to the Toronto French School, which I did as a kid. And I live in the Bay Area as well. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee or a Zoom meeting. That's it. You don't say why you want to meet. And the reason you don't say why you want to meet is if you say I'm looking for a job or something, they might feel bad and they won't, they won't be able to help you. So they won't answer. But if you don't say why you want to meet, they're kind of curious. Hmm, why does this person want to meet? And why would they take that meeting? Because you remind them of themselves when they were a lot younger. And so let me put it to you this way. And please keep typing your questions. If I told you that in 20 years, you'll be way more successful than you are today. And if in 20 years from now, somebody reaches out to you that's 20 years younger, that reminds you of yourself, would you take that meeting to help them? Of course you would. So ask and you'll receive. It's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. And you only have to be right in business one time and one meeting, meaning one informational meeting can change your life. So again, if you want to work at a certain company, set up 20, that's right, 20 informational meetings using the methodology I spoke about. Now, if you want more details on exactly uh, how to do this, what you can do is you can go to my website, which is harunmba.com. Scroll down to the bottom. There's a, there's a free book that you can get if you're curious. All right, let me go back here and we'll go to the next question. All right, uh, and then Frenchie wrote, uh, good morning to both of you. Uh, and then you asked a question about Palantir. Um, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about Palantir. So I invested in Palantir when it was a private company, uh, when I worked in the venture capital uh, sector. Uh, Peter Thiel's fund invested, and so did we. Um, and actually, we had to get approval from Peter Thiel and his fund to invest. 
um, whenever you want to buy secondary shares uh, and it's a private company, the board has the right of first refusal, meaning ROFR. And so it was nice of them to let us invest. And so when I did my due diligence on the company, um, I realized there were a couple of issues with the firm. Now, for those of you who haven't heard uh, about Palantir, uh, Palantir is an AI company and the Obama administration would not have found Osama bin Laden were it not for using Palantir software. And so Palantir software will look for patterns in the data and help you come to conclusions. And a lot of financial services firms uh, use Palantir as well uh, for cybersecurity reasons, uh, et cetera. Now, in terms of the limit, and I don't own Palantir, I sold when it was private and I worked in VC. In terms of the limitations of Palantir, just to be intellectually honest and objective, it's the margins will probably never be like a software company, like an Oracle, for example, because you need a lot of employees to feed the Palantir machine with data. Then you can analyze it. And one of the first investors uh, in Palantir uh, was the United States government and CIA's venture capital division, which is called InQtel. And InQtel invested a lot in Palantir. And InQtel, what they do is they invest in tech companies that can help the United States government. And so they are a force to be reckoned with out here in the Bay Area. Uh, the managing director is George Hoyam. I've met with him in his office out here, and maybe I'll bring him onto the call one week to interview him as well. Um, so those are the limitations uh, with, with Palantir. All right. Um, next up, uh, Renvir, thank you for that question on diagonal call spreads. Uh, later on today during the Silver MBA office hours, I'll show you how to do that uh, in real time. Okay. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, uh, if you had $10,000 and you're always putting money into, yeah, and I've publicly disclosed the four cryptos I've owned forever, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Ethereum, and Ripple, ticker XRP, how much in terms of proportion would you put in each token following all the rules you suggested to us? Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, um, you never have more than 5% of your liquid net worth in cryptos and no more than 0.5% in any one crypto. But if I had to rank those, I would definitely put Bitcoin way, way, way ahead of the others. And I probably invest more in Bitcoin than the other three combined. Uh, Bitcoin really is digital gold. And I really do believe that as governments overseas buy less treasuries, meaning they invest less in US dollars, they're going to be buying more gold. And if they're going to look for e-gold or electronic way to invest in gold, it's going to be Bitcoin. Yeah. And there's also a dearth of supply. And before you invest in any asset class, I don't care if it's real estate, stocks, uh, you know, bonds, cryptos, you always look at the underlying supply. And the great thing about Bitcoin is that by the year 2140, there will not be more than 21 million Bitcoins uh, that are mined. Always look at supply. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Jason wrote, uh, good morning from Texas. Thank you for providing valuable content uh, and more than fair price. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is, um, how do we build our leadership uh, position? Yeah. So it's kind of like the Rodin sculpture. I think therefore I am. You have to think of yourself as a thought leader and opine, give your opinion quite often through social media. How do you do that? Well, what I recommend doing is whatever it is you're most passionate about in business, you write a lot about it uh, on LinkedIn, and then you repurpose uh, what you write about. And, and I'll show you my methodology and, and what I did. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm wearing track pants, always. Yeah, <laughs> here's what I did. So I thought there was a problem with traditional MBA schools. And so what I did was I wrote one article every single week for two years on LinkedIn. and. The, the whole series was called Crucial Lessons Business Schools Don't Teach You. And so I did that for two years, 104 articles. And then what I did was I repurposed, repurposed all those articles into a book. Then I repurposed all the content of this book into tons of different courses. It took a while. And once you start creating social media content, you have to understand that it's a long-term game. Your competition is going to give up after a couple of months. So be consistent, at least I'm consistently bad, but I try, and repurpose your, your content. And think like a thought leader as well. Whatever you're interested in, write about it. And eventually what will happen if you're in it for the long run, which you should be, is the media 
will come to you and ask you questions. You'll get quoted, et cetera, which has humbly happened to me. And you'll be able to expand your brand, so to speak. And it's kind of like what, what Nintendo has been doing for decades. Um, they repurpose content. It's brilliant. Uh, and it's a high margin business for them. So they're older 8-bit, 16-bit, 64-bit, etc. cetera, uh, products. They've repurposed on newer consoles as well. So it's great from a margin expansion perspective for them. By the same token, you repurpose your content as well. The articles you write on LinkedIn can become vlogs. They can also become TikToks, which I do now. Instagrams, which I do. LinkedIn posts, all that stuff. And then you can also put it all together in a book. And it's so easy to write a book. And I'm going to provide you with a template to do this. And if you think what I'm about to tell you is too hard to do, then or too much work, then I want you to ask yourself this. And I say this with love my heart. How badly do you want that job or that customer? Nobody does this. It's really easy. After you write your articles, you throw it into a book. I'm going to give you a free template right now that you can download. I don't ask for your email address or anything. So the right way to write a book, and tons of my students have done so, including uh, Manas uh, in India. I have this book as, as well. It's called Bonds Before Business. But the way to do it is you go to my website, harunmba.com, and then you go here, all lowercase book. And then what you can do is you can download this template in Microsoft Word. If you know how to use Word in a browser, you can write a book. And then on the first page of this template, there's instructions on how to create your book for Kindle, how to create it for Amazon Print, and also uh, how to create it on audible.com. And if you want, you can spend five bucks and have somebody at Fiverr create the cover of your book in PSD format. That's Photoshop format. So when you download this book here, and I'll do this really quick because I have shown this before, it's really, really easy. And in this book, this is me buying time as it opens, but in this book, all you have to do is fill in all the chapters. And then after you fill in all the chapters, you right click on the uh, table of contents uh, and then you select repaginate. So here's the book right here. Um, so the first page is instructions, it's free. And then all you do is you fill in all of the chapters and then right click here and just update the field to repaginate. It's really, really simple. This format here is six inches by nine inches. I promise you, if you do this and if you're aggressive enough with networking, you will get the job of your dreams and you will be thought of as a thought leader per your question from a leadership perspective. All right. And please keep typing uh, your questions. All right. And, and thank you so much for those nice comments, um, uh, uh, Jason and, and Manas uh, as well. Uh, next question, uh, Mustafa wrote, uh, hey, Chris, do you recommend any AI specific companies that would be great uh, to invest in? So th the best way to think about uh, investments in a new sector, if you're not sure where to invest, is to look at ETFs. If you don't have time to do research on a company or a sector, just buy a liquid ETF with low fees. Then what you can do is you can look at the components of that ETF, the holdings, and do individual research on, on the companies you want to potentially invest in. And so for most of these AI-based ETFs, the largest component is NVIDIA. And I publicly disclosed that I bought NVIDIA in, in size last year, November. I'm no longer in the stock anymore. It's run up quite a bit. It's past my target price. Now, if you're not sure how to invest or where to find ETFs, the best source I can provide you with is called etfdatabase.com. So etfdb.com. And this is a great place to do research uh, on, on ETFs uh, in, in general. And so right here, what you can do is you can do uh, an ETF screen by sector. You can even look at blockchain ETFs. You can look at it by geography as well. Let's say that you want to invest in Brazil and you don't know what stocks to buy in Brazil and you want to have a diversified portfolio. You click here on Brazil and then what you can do is do research here. EWZ is a ticker on Brazil or, or for, for the Brazil ETF. And you can do more research right here or what you can do is you can go to Yahoo Finance to do more research on any one of these ETFs. So in this case, we're talking about EWZ or EWZ as we say in Canada. And you want to make sure that number one, it's liquid meaning the average volume is high enough so that you can get out if need be. Never invest in any stock or ETF that's illiquid, meaning it doesn't trade much. Otherwise, what happens is in a down market, the stock owns us rather than vice versa. 
The next thing you want to look at is the expense rate. And you want to try to make sure it's well under 1%. And what this means is for every 100 bucks you put into this, you're paying 58 pennies in fees every year, which is nothing compared to mutual funds. Then you click here on holdings to find out the breadth and depth of this ETF. Uh, as you can see from a sector perspective, it's mainly financial services and commodities, which kind of makes up the, the Brazilian economy as you know, you've know you got a bunch of, of uh, commodity companies here like Petrobras, Petroleum, Brazil, uh, et cetera. So ETFDB is, is a great source to use for when you're doing research on any companies. And I remember when I used to work in, in the hedge fund industry years ago, whenever I wanted to get short exposure to tech to offset the long side of my book, I would always invest in the SMH by shorting and do your research first, shorting the SMH, that's the Semiconductor Index. And my boss would always get upset with me. He'd say, Chris, we don't pay you to, to just short ETFs. Look at the components of that ETF and do research on them. That's what they'd say, which was the right call. All right. And let me see if there's any other questions here. Please keep typing them. Uh, let me go right to the top. I think I might have missed a bunch. Okay. Um, uh, Melody, who goes by How To Vids, uh, uh, wrote, uh, what would be good investments to start with to gift to a child? Uh, also, what would you recommend for a beginner to uh, invest in? Yeah. So what I would do for, for a child is you can purchase one share of Disney for them if you want. And there are so many different websites you can go to to order that certificate with their name on it. And I did that for my son, Andrew, uh, when he turned 11. For Christmas one year, I bought him one share of Manchester United in a nice frame. And it's, it's in his name as well. And he has it up on his wall, uh, along with pictures of, of Drake and basketball players. But it's nice to have up on his wall because it's something to influence him longer term. Think about long-term investing. So that's what I would say. In terms of your other question there, which is, um, what would you recommend to a beginner to invest in? So my go-to investment, when I'm not sure where to put capital, is always the VU, ticker V-O-O. -O. Do your own research first, obviously. But the VU is uh, an ETF for the S&P 500, meaning the 500 stocks that make up the U.S. economy. The fees are very low as well, at a couple of pennies per 100 bucks uh, per year. That's nothing. And in the long run, I put my reputation on the line. You will make money in the VU. So the S&P 500 historically is up close to 15% per year, historically. There are some great years and some awful years, of course. And so if all you did was you took your 401k, meaning your, re your retirement savings program of just over 22k, if all you did was you put that in the VU, meaning the S&P 500, every year for 20 years, you'd have over a million bucks. And it's a way to passively invest so that get the money taken out of your paycheck if you can. Uh, and I couldn't do it earlier on in my career and have much money. But get the money taken out of your paycheck automatically so it's out of sight, out of mind. And put into the VU through your retirement savings account. Now, if you're in a country other than the United States, and Melody, I know you're in the US, uh, it's not called a 401k. It's called something else. So do a search on what is the equivalent of 401k in your country name in Canada. It's called the RRSP, Registered Retirement Savings Program. So if you did that, you maxed out your 401k every year for 20 years and just put it in uh, the VU, meaning the S&P 500 index fund, then you'd have over a million dollars in 20 years. If your spouse did it, you'd have over $2 million uh, in 20 years. Now, what you can also do, speaking of investing for kids, I, I have three sons, they're, they're older now. We, we all love the color blue, color blue. But what we did for them, was we invested in their educational savings account, which is very similar to a 401k. And you can put, I think, about 15k per year for each child. And if you did that over 18 years until the child goes to college, if they want to go, then that's 700 grand per child. So it all adds up. And unlike a 401k, so when you take your money out of the 401k, you're going to pay taxes on it in the future, but it's going to be a much bigger amount. It's even better with, uh, with uh, an educational savings account because you can take the money out tax-free to pay for their university. And then they can keep the rest to buy a house later, in which case they'll pay taxes on that many years uh, down the road. So I would say 
the earlier you can get your, your kids or ourselves uh, in general to invest, the better because of the, the inherent time value of money. Yeah. And Warren Buffett once said, you got to spend what is left after saving instead of saving what is left after spending. And the best way to save is to have money automatically, if we can, taken out of our account, meaning taken out of our paycheck and invested directly in your retirement savings program. A lot of companies will, will do that for you. And sometimes they will match one to one or 10% to one, so to speak, in terms of how much money you put into your savings accounts. Yeah. And they get tax breaks too. All right. Marin, how are you? G great to see you. Uh, I talked about you recently, actually. I was, I was interviewed by Fast Company. Uh, along with Vital, and I mentioned your name in terms of the next school we're going to build uh, in, in Kenya, in, in your, your your hometown. Next up, we have uh, Ashby, who wrote, uh, greetings from the, the Bahamas. It's better in the Bahamas. I love the Bahamas. Yeah, that was an old advertising campaign. Uh, next up, Andre wrote, good morning from, from Dallas, and thank you for the, those emojis. Good morning to you as well, and uh, congratulations if you're a Rangers fan for your, your first World Series victory. Um, it was incredible. Incredible game last night. All right, Mr. Roy, uh, good good to see you. Uh, and then Renvier wrote, with respect to investing in options, how do you um, decrease the risk of getting assigned? So I don't recommend that that my students invest in options unless you're just going to buy puts or buy calls because the most you can lose is the amount you, you paid for the, the, the call or the put. If you're going to underwrite them, meaning sell them and issue them yourself, which tons of people do, be really careful because you can lose way, way more than the amount that you invested. And what happens also when you create options to sell them is if somebody bought an option similar to the one that you sold, but it's somebody else, you still might get randomly assigned to cover their position. It's a bizarre rule that most beginners don't know about. And they say that the, the percent of the probability of you getting uh, randomly assigned is about 10%. And if you, if you underwrite enough options, you will get assigned at some point. Just be really careful. Really careful. There's a reason why to invest in options, you have to have a margin account. It's dangerous. All right. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Nintendo. How are you? Uh, wrote here, hey, Chris, it's been a while since I've been on the, the chat of your live, live stream. Welcome back. You wrote, in your opinion... What is the best school of thought uh, for economics? I'm not a, a, a big economics fan. Um, and in my, my courses, I really don't teach that stuff uh, because it, it's very elusive. You'll never see me talk about uh, supply and demand charts. Um, but I, I guess John Maynard Keynes and the invisible hand, et cetera. Uh, the best MBA program, by the way, if you care about economics, is by far the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business. Okay, uh, next up, um, hey, Yolanda, how are you? Uh, great to see you. It's, it's been a couple of years. Hope you're doing well. Yolanda was in my first class back in 2019. Great to see you. Michael uh, wrote, uh, hi, Chris from Guadalupe. Uh, uh, great to see you. I hope you join us again. Thank you. All right, uh, and then Anurag asked earlier about valuation methodologies uh, for investing in stocks. So, my favorite methodology by far uh, is price to earnings. And the reason I say that uh, is because um, earnings and cash flow kind of converge in the long run. And the problem with using discounted cash flow analysis is there's so many inputs. So if I told you X plus one is two, what is X? Well, you know what it is. If I tell you X plus one plus two plus book plus dumb teacher is three, what is X? No idea. That's why I'm not a big fan of value and companies using DCF. Now, in terms of value and companies that are not profitable, you can always look at price to revenue. And Brent called it EV to revenue today, which is a little bit more sophisticated looking at price to revenue. Um, and when you value companies that are unprofitable, you can also value them off of PE if you forecast your earnings into the future, many years into the future then you can value your company based on your earnings estimate in five or 10 years from now. And that's how the best investors make a fortune. They don't look at this year's numbers or next year's. 
They look at their earnings estimates in their financial models 5, 10, 15 years from now. And they value companies based on that. So for me, when I worked in the hedge fund industry, I remember years ago, I owned LinkedIn when it was publicly traded and Amazon. And people thought I was crazy. They said, Chris, that's a widow maker. Awful thing to say. Uh, and I'd say, why do you say that? And they would say, because those companies are trading at over 100 times earnings. And I would say, with love in my heart, no, you're wrong. They're trading at three times my earnings estimates in five and 10 years. The longer the view, the wiser the intention. And Warren Buffett says that whenever he buys a stock, he buys it with the assumption that the stock market will be closed for 10 years. Obviously, he knows it won't be closed, but that's how long-term focused he is. And that way, you know, you can tell yourself, I don't know the path, but I know the destination. And you won't freak out. And I, another great Warren Buffett quote, he said, the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff and it goes on sale. Think about that. Selling something you like because it's cheaper. Doesn't make any sense. So the bottom line is be very long-term focused and I humbly recommend building your own financial models and then valuing companies based on your earnings estimates in 5, 10, or 15 years. And then uh, in terms of Renbeer's question earlier for Brent about meeting with uh, tech CEOs, how do you differentiate between good and bad CEOs? Uh, there's one other thing I'd add to that answer, uh, which is I believe that a, a great CEO is a great salesperson. That's how they became CEO. They kept asking internally to get promoted over the years and they can sell. And that's why great CEOs at the end of quarters usually help their quota carrying salespeople close deals to make the quarter. So great CEOs can sell and great CEOs can make you excited about something that is really boring. Like Mark Benioff, you know, back in 1999 when he launched salesforce.com, it was a cloud computing software company. It sounded really boring, but he made it exciting. And he leveraged the media a lot by being controversial to get free PR. And he did it tastefully too. How? He went on the Jim Cramer show, Mad Money and tons of other financial television programs. And he talked about how software is dead. And his logo was, was a, a picture of software with the line through it. Software is dead because in the long run, we're all going to move to the cloud. So Richard Branson, who's also a great salesperson like Benioff, is also controversial in his approach, which is free media attention. And so what Sir Richard Branson did uh, was in the early 1980s, he launched a product called Virgin Cola. And he rented a tank. And on the tank were tons of cans of Virgin Cola. And he declared war on Coca-Cola. And he drove that tank uh, through Times Square, right in front of the New York Times headquarters as well. Of course, you can't do that today. But he was very controversial. And he's a great salesperson as well. And he's a great motivator, uh, uh, inspirational speaker. And he has one of the best quotes I ever heard, which is, screw it, let's do it. And I say that all the time. Okay. And if you don't get excited about a company and their products after you watch an interview with a CEO or after you meet with a CEO, then their customers are not going to get excited either. And when you're doing due diligence or investment research on a company, the last thing you should do, the very last step is meeting with the CEO or watching them interview. And I say that because they are the best salespeople in the world. And I want you, and I say it with love my heart because I care. I want you to do your due diligence. And I remember when I worked at Goldman years ago uh, and I worked uh, on many IPOs, um, I would be bullish, meaning positive on every IPO because I saw all the CEOs present. And I learned you can't invest that way. You have to do your own research first and then meet with the management team or watch an interview with them, et cetera. And if you want to get promoted in your company and make CEO or vice president one day, please understand that all these people that are in senior positions behind closed doors, they asked over and over and over again to be promoted. You have to ask always. If you're in a company and you find that your peers are getting promoted faster than you and you're doing a better job than them, the reason is because behind closed doors are asking to get promoted over and over and over again. You have to be relentless, but you have to do it tastefully too. So how do you ask for a promotion or a raise? Well, when your boss comes up to you and congratulates you on a big accomplishment, what I recommend doing is striking while the iron's hot and asking them, thank you so much. Um, do you have time for a coffee? 
And they'll probably say yes. And during that meeting, what you say is this. You know, we've accomplished a lot as a team, yada, yada, yada. I'm so glad to be part of this team. Um, as you know, um, it's really expensive to raise a family in the Bay Area, if, if it's true where you live. Um, and I wanted to humbly ask you, what do I need to accomplish? Meaning what additional value do I need to add to our team in order to get considered for a promotion or a raise? And they'll tell you. And you write all that down, obviously. And then three or six months down the road, after they congratulate you on doing something else great, you meet with them again. And you start, you know, you start the meeting with, you know, as a team, we've accomplished a lot, yada, yada, all that good stuff. Um, and then you say, um, you know, last time we met, um, you gave me some great feedback uh, on what I need to humbly accomplish in order to, you know, get considered for a promotion or a raise. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you, and thank you for your time that I've actually accomplished all these. And so I'd love to ask you, please, uh, for a promotion or a raise. And every three months, I want you to sit down with your boss and ask for feedback. And if you do that every three months, I promise you the probability of you being let go if there's an economic downturn is much lower. And if you don't feel comfortable sitting down with your boss and asking what I need to, to do to be considered for a promotion, you can always contact HR internally at your company if you work at a big company and ask to see if there's criteria or some kind of like a rubric for teachers to find out what you need to accomplish in order to get to the next level. Okay. Asking you'll receive is prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. And a lot of people that, um, you know, w when you're younger and you're in school, like your high school, university, if you keep your head down, you get good grades, you know, life works out well. Your parents are proud of you. You know, you're, you're proud of yourself, et cetera. And then you join the corporate world and you keep your head down and you work really hard and you think someone's going to notice me just like in school. It's not like that. You look around and you realize that other people are getting promoted or raises faster than you. And the reason is because behind closed doors, they're asking for that promotion or that raise. You'll never get anything in life unless you ask. You, you won't get a date. You won't get a promotion. You won't get a customer, et cetera. And don't worry about being shot down because in business and in life, you only have to be right one time in terms of important meetings. Yeah, it's a numbers game. All right. Give me one second. Next question is, uh, do you see a recession or a big pullback short term? Uh, and when will rates be back to zero uh, as a U.S. consumer is used to? Uh, um, and then you did a follow up uh, here. Yeah. So. I would say that the probability of recession is, is way under 50%. I know that the yield curve is inverted, meaning that uh, the probability of recession is relatively high. Um, but there's a, there's a quote that I'm going to butcher, which is that economists have successfully predicted 42 of the last three recessions. Now, I don't know where the market's going near term. Nobody does. And if, if, if there are any day traders on this call, please stop. Please don't be a day trader. And I say it with love my heart. Because stocks go up and down in a short amount of time for usually stuff outside of your control, like geopolitical chatter between governments, or it might be news flow uh, on a similar company to the one you invest in, or it could be a positive or econo negative economic data point. And each month has 20 weekdays. That means 20 trading days. So you got to be long-term focused. Nobody knows what the market's going to do in the short run. But if you're long-term focused, you'll get better sleep at night. You won't panic and you'll be much more wealthy in the long run. That much I promise you. Yeah. That's why there's tons of long-term investors. We know their names, Warren Buffett, et cetera, but we can't name a single successful day trader. Yeah. And day trading, is it's kind of like going to a casino. And the worst thing that can happen to you is you go to a casino for the first time and you make money. Just like the worst thing that can happen to you is you trade a stock and you make money because you think it's repeatable, but it's not. Yeah. And again, I say that as always with love in my heart. Okay, next question. Okay, next question is Fred Mendoza. How are you? Gr great to see you from, from DC, I think. Yeah, um, you were my, my student uh, uh, years ago. I remember that. And you met with uh, Dr. Fauci, I remember you told me at one point. Um, you said, how do I approach equity firms in buying real estate deals? Yeah, so I'll answer that more generically. Um, in terms of raising money uh, for your startup, uh, or for any investment in general, 
you have to get a lawyer to first, first of all, draft up the investment offering memorandum. You can do this on the cheap by going to LegalZoom.com. I don't take sponsors, I never will, but you can go to LegalZoom.com for more details on that. I've worked with them before. Then what I would say is when you're raising money, I would say the sales cycle is a lot shorter if you meet with high net worth individuals because there's only one decision maker, the high net worth individual. If you're trying to raise capital from institutions like pension funds or venture capital firms, it can take years, years of due diligence. So I would go after high net worth investors initially. How do you do that? Well, what I would do is leverage LinkedIn and set up informational meetings with people that you have something in common with that are high net worth. And if you try to do that and you're not getting success, let me know and I'll help you with a plan B. And you gotta have three pitches too. You gotta have a 30 minute pitch, a five minute pitch and a 30 second pitch. The most important one is a 30 second pitch, the little sound bite, the elevator pitch they call it. Uh, next question is, uh, we work was valued at $40 billion three years back. Now it's filing for bankruptcy. What mistakes uh, do big firms and analysts make while valuing such stocks? Yeah. So one of the issues, aside from the awful accounting uh, to, uh, lack of disclosure for the company, um, is that they were focused on two things. You know, one is investing in startups and the other is renting office space. And the problem is that for a company to make it, they have to focus on only one thing initially and be very good at it. If they're focused on a couple things, they just won't be able to execute. Yeah. But it's hard to really gauge the accounting issues. Like I never invest in companies that don't have well-known auditors, you know, like KPMG or Deloitte, whatever it might be. There's usually four or five of them that matter. Um, but for them, it's hard. To, it's really hard to know when somebody's lying to you. It really is from an accounting perspective. And that's why we always have to diversify and never have more than 5% of your capital in any one stock. Yeah. Uh, Jason wrote, how do we gain great, and you put in quotes here, great management team status? Yeah. Well, I would say the best leaders are good listeners. And the best leaders also criticize in private, but praise in public. And the best leaders, like football coaches, et cetera, are great motivators. They motivate people. Kind of like I believe a great parent or a great teacher is somebody that instills unstoppable confidence in their subordinates or their children, et cetera. If you build people's confidence up, then you're going to accomplish a gazillion times more. Okay, give me one second, just getting through the questions here. Joe wrote, do you recommend looking at a Roth IRA for a child? Yeah, um, it all depends on your, your tax mandate and you always have to talk to an accountant about this before even considering investing in an IRA or retirement savings. Because sometimes if you invest in a certain security or product, you can't move it into a savings into a, a tax shelter after you've purchased it. You have to buy it within that. So always call your accountant. And, and I say this as always with love my heart to everybody, never do your own taxes. Doing your own taxes is like doing surgery on yourself. You know, there, there's a reason why the accounting profession exists. The tax laws change all the time, all the time. And a, a good accountant will get you the best tax breaks and keep you out of trouble as well. And it's hard to find a good accountant by searching online. There's really no Yelp for accountants. The best way to find a good accountant is to talk to your rich or successful aunts, uncles, friends, business associates, etc., and ask them. Yeah. Now, in terms of a Roth IRA, uh, the way it works, for those of you not familiar with it, is it's, it's kind of the opposite of a 401k savings account. So with a 401k, you put money in, it grows, then you take it out, and then you pay tax. With a Roth IRA, you pay tax first, and then you put the money in, and then it grows over time. And when you take the money out, you don't pay taxes. And there are certain rules, like if you're self-employed, it's it's kind of tricky to do it yourself. Uh, but Peter Thiel, 
um, who's the first investor in Facebook and probably one of the best venture capitalists in the world. He has billions of dollars in his Roth IRA because what he did was he put, I think his Facebook and maybe Palantir investments at 0.001 cent per share or something like that into his Roth IRA, he paid tax first and now it's growing exponentially. Yeah, talk to your accountant first, yeah. Uh, Jason wrote, what books are you reading uh, right now? Alexa, read my book. Getting your selection from Audible, resuming Elon Musk. Alexa, stops. That's the book I'm reading. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's the same author that wrote the Steve Jobs book and Da Vinci book years ago. It's great. And I find that I learn a lot about business by listening to biographies and autobiographies of successful people. And the reason why that, that can really help you learn is because it's not theoretical. And as people become more successful, part of the reason that they became successful is because they help other people and they want to share what they've, what they've learned. And so I love listening to books by Sir Richard Branson, especially the one he narrates himself and anybody successful because they, 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 they share their blueprint for success. And so for me, I listen to a lot of biographies and autobiographies. Yeah. In terms of great books, I recommend, um, one of my favorite business books uh, is, is called uh, The Winner's Dream. Uh, it's by Bill McDermott, who is the brilliant CEO uh, of, um, of ServiceNow. Uh, and I knew him years ago when he was the CEO of, of SAP. Um, and if you want to learn how to sell, listen to his audiobook as well. So, um, yeah, and he narrates himself, The, the Winner's Dream. Aside from that, uh, probably the most important business book I've, I've talked about before is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. My son, Andrew, just loved it. I read it. He loved it. Uh, it's old. It was written in the 1930s, but it's timeless because personal relationships and human nature does not change over time. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Another great book by Dale Carnegie is, is called um, uh, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And he teaches you how to live in day tight compartments. Like, don't worry about the future too much. It's hard to control. The past you certainly can't control, so forget about that. And Dale Carnegie said in that book um, that it's not work that kills us, it's worry. And Sir Winston Churchill once said, I once met a man on his deathbed who talked about all the worries he had in his life, none of which came true. So th those are a couple of, a couple of books for you. Yeah. If you want to, if, if you're into finance and investing, uh, there's, there's one book I recommend. It's called Financial Shenanigans by Howard Schillett. It'll tell you how to read financial statements like a good book. Yeah. Uh, Robert wrote, uh, what is the ETF risk if the managing company like uh, Spider or iShares goes bankrupt? Oh gosh, uh, I, I would never see that happen, but there's always that possibility. Um, so what you can do if you want, uh, and, and so Vanguard is the best ETF company on the planet. Uh, and they're the ones that issue the VU ETF for the S&P 500 that I invest in. I highly doubt they would ever go bankrupt. They're very well capitalized. They have minimal expenses because they just invest in ETFs. They don't have to hire high profile MBAs to manage a fund. Uh, but if you're worried about that, then I would diversify. There's a gazillion ways to invest in ETFs that represent the S&P 500. You can diversify amongst different companies. That's a good point. I've never had that question before. That's smart. Yeah. But the reason why I, I always love recommending the S&P 500, if you're not sure where to put your money, is because it's the lowest risk equity investment on the planet. And the very last company, so to speak, on this planet to go bankrupt would be the U.S. government. Yeah, I know the U.S. government doesn't have much to do with the S&P 500, but you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. All right. And Melody wrote, uh, thanks, Chris. Hope you had a good Halloween. Thank you. And I remember... Four years ago, October 31st, 2019, you were on that webcast, this weekly webcast, actually. Um, uh, and, and it was a nine hour webcast and, and your two kids were on it, actually. I remember wearing their Halloween costumes. They were about to go out trick or treating. It was, yeah, yeah I hope, hope you're doing well, yeah. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Michael wrote, hello, Chris, greetings from Nigeria. Great to see you, I hope you're doing well, okay. Uh, and then uh, Ralph wrote, uh, what about options? Would you recommend that we do that? Yeah. So the only time I would, I would buy options are to buy puts or calls. And let me explain what that means really quickly. So a call option is 
<clears throat> you invest a relatively small amount of money. And if the stock goes up, you make sometimes multiple times that. But the most you can lose is that, what you paid for it. A put is the opposite. You, you invest in a put. If the stock goes down, you can make money. If it goes up, you lose whatever you invested. Now, that, those are, that's called buying a put or buying a call. Don't sell them, meaning don't underwrite them because you can lose way, way, way more money. Now, the reason why um, people buy puts, aside from thinking that a stock might go down, is because they want to hedge themselves. Think of it like an insurance policy. Let's say that you own a ton of Coca-Cola, ticker KO, and you don't want to sell it because you don't want to pay taxes. And at the same time, you're not sure what to do with it because you're too exposed to that stock. It's a massive position if you're on the long side. Well, what you can do is you can buy a put to offset any kind of decline in Coca-Cola. And so what happens is if the stock goes down, you won't lose money. And if the stock goes up, the most you can lose is what you paid for the put. Now, these options, when you invest in them, they've got the element of time. They expire after a while. The only reason to buy a call option, I think, um, is if you've done a lot of due diligence, like a lot of research on a company, you've looked at the fundamentals, the valuation of the company, you build out your financial model, and your target price is way, way higher than where the stock is now. Well, what you can do is you can invest in calls that are long dated, meaning calls uh, that, uh, that expire in more than one year, and that's called a leap. But if you're going to do that, make sure you do th your thorough due diligence first on the underlying stock. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brent Phil, uh, for joining us today. I'm so humbled he joined us. Uh, God bless you all. Have, have a great week, and I'll see you next week and every single week. Please click the like button and subscribe, and, and thanks again. Thank you. And if you're in my, my silver uh, MBA program, I'll see you. I'll see you at 10.